Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to talk about replacing an outlet, and we'd like to thank Hulo08 for a four-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. In 1956, grounded outlets were required on open porches, garages, and other areas where a person may be standing on the ground. In 1959, grounded outlets were required additionally in laundry rooms, basements, workshops, outside, or other locations where a person could be standing on the ground. In 1969, UL required three-pronged plugs on major appliances, and only about half of U.S. homes had three-slot receptacles in 1969. Wow. Wild, huh? Mm-hmm. In 1971, the NEC, the National Electrical Code, required grounded three-slot receptacles in all parts of a home. Hmm. If you plan on doing electrical projects around the house, three electrical testers you should have are a non-contact electrical tester, an outlet tester, and a multimeter. A non-contact electrical tester will light up and many will sound an alert for live wires. You would put the end of the tester on or near a wire that you're testing or the narrow slot of an outlet, turn on the tester, and if it's live or the electric is on, it will give you an alert. Okay. An outlet or receptacle tester plugs into an outlet and it detects the most common wiring problems. Most will have lights that correspond to a printed code on the tester. Most will test for an open ground, an open neutral, an open hot. It'll check if the hot and ground are reversed or the hot and neutral are reversed. And it'll also show if it's wired correctly and grounded correctly. So open meaning it's disconnected? Correct. It can also be used just to let you know whether the circuit is live. A multimeter will test batteries. It'll test for 120 volts, 240 volts, low voltage, and continuity. Mm -hmm. And you can check out our episode called Electrical Testers for more information. Super exciting. Always turn off the electric to any circuit you're working on and double check the wires with a tester. A shock under certain conditions can be deadly. Before you purchase a new outlet, find the breaker to the circuit. You need to know if it's 15 or 20 amps. Why? If the circuit's 15 amps, you only want to purchase 15 amp outlets. If it's a 20 amp circuit, you can purchase 15 or 20 amp outlets. Okay. You never want to put a 20 amp outlet on a 15 amp circuit because it allows you to plug in a 20 amp device which could potentially be a fire hazard under certain conditions. Okay. Many homes will have 15-amp outlets on 20-amp circuits in most of the rooms in the house except the kitchen. Why? Because it costs less to put them in, and it's uncommon to plug in a 20-amp appliance or tool into a bedroom or living room. But in the kitchen, it's more likely that you might be plugging in a 20-amp appliance. Or in the garage. Right. Is there a difference between the inexpensive outlets and the more expensive one? So the more expensive outlets or commercial-grade outlets have higher-grade, more durable internal parts, better contacts, and a heavier body. In an inexpensive residential outlet, for example, you're going to have two thin contacts to grab the blades on a plug. In a commercial-grade outlet, you'll have thicker contacts that are angled to help hold the plug blades better Or you'll have three contacts to create a much more secure connection. If you're replacing a lot of outlets throughout your home and you're on a budget, you could put inexpensive outlets in areas where the outlet isn't going to be used regularly. and Like behind a couch? Right, exactly. And install commercial-grade outlets where you're going to be constantly plugging in things like appliances or a vacuum, for example. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons you should replace old outlets. If the outlet's been used so much that it doesn't hold a plug firmly anymore, there can be a small space between the blade and the contacts, which can cause arcing and be a fire hazard. Right. 
For a standard outlet called a duplex receptacle, you're going to have two areas to plug things in. A decora or a more decorative outlet will have a rectangular shaped body and you need a cover to match that shape. Mm -hmm. An outlet is going to have brass screws on the side with the narrow slots and silver screws on the side with the wide slots. You connect your hot wire or wires to the brass screws or that side. The neutral wire or wires go to the silver screws or that side of the outlet. There's going to be a metal tab that connects the two screws on each side. So if you only have one hot or one neutral wire and you put it around one of the screw terminals, that tab is going to connect the other receptacle. And you would break that brass tab for a switched outlet, or in some cases you would break both tabs if you have two circuits to an outlet. Have you ever had to do that? Well, for switched outlets, yeah, especially here. Well, in the, I it, know switched outlets, yeah. but I'm saying for both. No, I've never run into one, and I've, oh, super exciting I've, if they do. <laughs> I've replaced a lot of outlets. Yeah, and in that case, so in a lot of older homes, what they would do is they would run a an outlet underneath your sink, and they would run two circuits to that, so you have one side of the receptacle for a garbage disposal and the other side of the receptacle for a dishwasher. Okay. So you could have two circuits to one outlet, and let's say it's one circuit is 15 amps to your dishwasher, and then 15 amps to the garbage disposal. Hmm. So you're not tripping your breaker when you have them both on. Right. Most of the outlets in newer homes will have plastic shutters to make them tamper-resistant for kids. It's going to help prevent electrocution. If a child sticks a key or some other metal item into the outlet, a plug has to be inserted into both slots at the same time for those shutters to open. Hmm. Tamper-resistant outlets are code and should be installed when you're replacing outlets. But what's strange is hardware stores still sell outlets that aren't tamper-resistant. Right. So check the label. You'll see TR or TRR for tamper-resistant receptacle. Cool. It's easy to identify a 15-amp outlet compared to a 20-amp outlet. Right. A 15-amp outlet has two parallel slots, one narrow and one wide, so a polarized plug fits into it properly. The narrow slot is hot, the neutral slot is wide, and you're going to have a ground opening, which is a semicircle shape. On a 20-amp outlet, the neutral slot is T-shaped. So if you have a 15-amp circuit and a 15-amp outlet, you can't plug in a 20-amp appliance because plugging in a 20-amp appliance on a 15-amp circuit could potentially be a fire hazard. Right. Before you remove the old outlet, check your electrical tester first on a live circuit to make sure the tester is working properly. Then turn off the breaker to the circuit and double-check it with your tester. Remove the cover plate and remove the two screws holding the old outlet in place. If you've used an outlet tester to check the outlet, you're going to know whether it was wired properly. Mm -hmm. Keep track of which wires go to which side of the old outlet, especially if you're in an old home and all the colors on the insulation look the same. Right. If you're in a home with non-metallic cable, the hot wires will be black or red, the neutral wire is white, and the ground wire is bare copper. There's going to be no insulation on that ground wire. Right. If your home has metal conduit, individual wires have been pulled through the conduit. The hot wires can be any color except white or green. White is neutral, green is ground. And in most homes with conduit, there will be no ground wire. Like here in the Chicago area, we very seldom ever see a ground wire in the electrical boxes. The metal box and the metal conduit is your ground path back to the service panel. When you screw in an outlet into the metal box, the metal screw and that mounting strap makes contact with the metal box, creating a safe ground. The strap is connected to the green ground screw on the outlet. If you have a metal box and no ground wire, you can confirm that the box is grounded by using a multimeter. With the outlet removed, you're going to separate all the wires so the power's off. The outlet is removed. You're going to separate all the wires so nothing's touching. You're going to turn back on the power to the circuit, and you're going to test for 120 volts between the hot wire and the metal box. You're going to touch your red probe to the hot wire, the black probe to the metal box, and if the box is grounded, it's going to show 120 volts. Okay. 
After you do a test like this, make sure you turn back off the power. Once you've removed the wires from the old outlet, you're going to have either one or two cables in the box. If you're replacing an outlet at the end of a run of outlets, you're going to have one cable with a hot, neutral, and ground wire if you have non-metallic cable, or you're going to have one hot and one neutral wire without a ground for most conduit. Although in some metal boxes, you may have a green grounding wire that has been screwed into the metal box. If you have a ground wire in a metal box, connect it to the green grounding screw on the outlet. Exciting. If you have an outlet in the middle of a run, you're going to have two cables. Two hot wires, two neutral wires, and two bare ground wires for non-metallic cable, and for conduit, two hot and two neutral wires. On the old outlet, if there was one cable, the hot wire will be connected to one of the brass screws, the neutral wire will be connected to one of the silver screws, and the bare ground wire to the green grounding screw. If you have two cables, it could be wired a couple different ways. You can either have the two hot wires going to the two brass screws on the hot side, the two neutral wires going to the screw terminals on the silver side, and each wire under its own screw terminal. You're not allowed to have more than one wire under a screw terminal, because right. it could potentially be a fire hazard. Or you could have your two hot wires connected together underneath a wire connector, with a short pigtail wire coming out of it, that pigtail, let's say on the hot side, could be connected to either brass screw. You'll have the same on the neutral side. Your two neutral wires connected under a wire connector and a short pigtail wire coming out, and that pigtail connected to one of the silver screws on the neutral side. And then your bare ground wires are going to be connected together with a pigtail coming out to the green grounding screw. Alrighty. If you're wrapping the wires under the screw terminals on the new outlet, loop the wire with about three quarters of an inch of the insulation removed and wrap that wire clockwise around the screw. The end of the loop should be on the right side if you're facing the screw. This way the wire will tighten down under the screw better. If you wrap it counterclockwise, it can push away from the screw on some outlets. Hmm. And you want to snug that screw down firmly. You don't want that screw to loosen up. Right. On inexpensive residential outlets, there are usually four small holes, slightly larger than 14-gauge wire, for backstabbing. You'd remove about a half an inch of insulation from the wire, keep it straight, and push it into the hole up to the insulation on the wire. Mm -hmm. There's a metal contact called a blade that connects to the wire, it's angled and shaped to help keep the wire in place. And your hot wires would go on the two holes next to the brass screws. Your neutral wires would go into the two holes next to the silver screws. Some electricians don't recommend backstabbing. When you push the outlet into the box, the wire can get wedged against the box and put pressure on the blade, causing a loose connection which could potentially overheat the outlet and be a fire hazard. Hmm. And backstabbing isn't allowed with 20-amp, 12-gauge wire. Couldn't with... they have come up with a better name than backstabbing? <laughs> well, I was on a couple different electricians' forums, and they were talking about you know the problems a lot of these electricians had with outlets that were backstabbed. And they say they get a lot of service calls from backstabbing. And then there were a couple electricians that said, hey, I've never had a problem with backstabbing. And so some of the electricians were calling them backstabbers. <laughs> and you'll find those backstab holes on 15-amp outlets. On more expensive or commercial-grade outlets, there can be plates under the screw terminals for back wiring. You would strip about a half an inch of insulation from the wire and push the wire straight under the plate, then tighten down the screws. And this gives a very good connection. Hmm. Electricians like this. If you're wiring under a screw, there should be stripped wire under the screw and no stripped wire past the body of the outlet. And you want the wire fully stripped under the screw. You don't want any insulation under the screw. Okay. For back wiring, you want the wire fully stripped under the plate and no stripped wire beyond the outlet. Okay. When you've connected your hot wires to the brass side, the side with the narrow slots, and the neutral wires to the silver side, the side with the wide slots, and you've connected your ground wire if you have it, you can fold the wires and push the outlet into the box. 
you're going to screw it into the box and put on your cover. Turn on the electric and test the outlet. An outlet tester is great for this. It's going to tell you whether it's wired properly, it's grounded, and there's no problems. Cool. In many parts of the country, rooms without an overhead light will have switched outlets. And that's code now. A switched outlet will have two hot wires going to the brass screws. For non-metallic cable, it could be a black and red wire, or it could be one black wire and a white wire marked with either black or red tape or marker to identify it as a hot wire. For conduit, hot is going to be any color except white or green. On a switched outlet, the brass tab is broken between the two brass screw terminals, and that completely separates the two receptacles. You have one that's always on. The other one is going to be operated with a switch for a lamp. Mm -hmm. When you're replacing an old outlet and you remove the outlet and you have two wires going to the hot side, check the outlet to see whether that brass tab is broken. And if you have a switched outlet, you know that that brass tab should be broken. Right. And when you install the new outlet, you need to break the brass tab. How would you break it? You would use a needle nose pliers, grab that tab, and just bend it back and forth a few times, and it'll snap right off. Cool. The newest electrical code says GFCIs or GFCI protection is needed for outlets in the kitchen, the bathroom, the basement, crawl space, laundry room, the garage, outside. You need GFCI protection for a dishwasher now, whirlpools, bathtubs with jets, a sump pump, a swimming pool, a spa, or any outlet that's within six feet of water. Hmm. And your local code may vary because they haven't updated this yet, but GFCI protection will help protect against a shock hazard. It will turn off the power to the outlet in a fraction of a second if a shock risk is detected. You can have one GFCI installed in the first electrical box in a run of outlets, and that will protect all regular outlets past the GFCI. Right. And you should check out our episode called GFCIs and AFCIs on tips, how to wire the line and the load side for GFCIs and AFCIs. Studies say that thousands of lives have been saved by updating to GFCI and AFCI protection. Okay. AFCIs are arc fault circuit interrupters, and they help protect against a fire. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission estimates about 5,000 fires every year are caused by receptacles. Hmm. The National Fire Protection Association says some common causes of arc faults are nails driven into walls and penetrating into an electrical cable, which causes arcing. Cables nailed or stapled too tightly against a wall stud can damage the insulation and cause arcing. Furniture pushed up against an electrical cord plugged into an outlet can damage the cord and the insulation and potentially cause arcing. And extension cords or power cords with damaged or worn insulation can cause arcing and a fire. And AFCIs are like GFCIs. They're going to protect all the outlets on a run past the AFCI if it's wired properly. Cool. In 1999, AFCIs were first required in bedrooms. And now the new code says AFCI protection is required in kitchens, a dishwasher circuit, in dining rooms, living rooms, bedrooms, finished basements, family rooms, dens, recreation rooms, libraries, parlors, hallways, closets, laundry rooms, and sunrooms. If you're in an older home, AFCI protection is going to make your house a lot safer? Yes, absolutely. And now GFCIs and AFCIs are required in the kitchen, laundry room, finished basements, and for the dishwasher. All right. Another thing GFCIs are good for in older homes with the two-slot outlets with no ground wire, a GFCI is going to allow you to replace the two-slot non-grounded outlet with a three-slot GFCI, and that's going to give you shock protection. The GFCI has to be marked no equipment ground, and any two-slot outlets you change to three-slot outlets on that GFCI circuit, so past the GFCI, you have to put a label on those outlets too. 
and the labels come in the box with the GFCI. The GFCI is protecting against shock, so it's going to make an ungrounded circuit much safer, but any electronics and some sensitive equipment, it's not going to be protected against static buildup, which is what a grounded outlet does. So you're putting that sticker on there so you realize that sensitive equipment isn't going to be protected like a grounded circuit would protect them. Okay. And you're not allowed to replace a two-slot outlet with a three-slot outlet if there's no way to ground it. Why? Because if you plug in an appliance that has a three-pronged plug, it could potentially be a shock hazard. Okay. Some top-rated electrical testers come from Sperry, S-P-E-R-R-Y, Fluke, F-L-U-K-E, Klein, K-L-E-I-N, Kaiwetz, it's K-A-I-W-E-E-T-S, and Astro A-I, A-S-T-R-O-A-I. Do you have anything else to add? Before you change an outlet, check to see whether it's a 15 or 20 amp circuit. If it's a 15 amp circuit, only use 15 amp outlets. A 20 amp circuit, you can use 15 or 20 amp outlets. If you have two hot wires going to the brass side of the old outlet, check to see if the brass tab is broken. If it is, you need to break it on the new outlet. Always turn off the power to any circuit you're working on and double check it with an electrical tester. Working with electrical can be a shock or fire hazard. If you're uncomfortable or unsure, contact an electrician. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our ebooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, books 1 through 15 on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. And you can follow us on Instagram, fixithomeimprove. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Do you